in the same year as, as Terzaki was writing his, his paper on effective stress, one of his, one of his students, Arthur Casagrande, was, had, had came up with a series of, of, of experiments to, to define what is known as a critical voids ratio. So if something is very, very loosely packed, has a high voids ratio. If something is very dense, there's not very many voids in there. If you densify your soil, you know, I would think you get a bowl of sugar in a cafe and shake it. Who's never done this? So you actually, the level goes down. You know, that you're densifying it, and so you're reducing the voids ratio. So basically, what, 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 what Arthur Casagrande said, that as you shear a soil, and so what we're doing now is, is taking the soil and shearing it, rather than just compressing it like this, just shearing it. If you shear a soil, it will want to change volume. If it's a very loose soil, as you shear it, the soil particles want to move closer together. Because if you think of lots of it, imagine all those little ping pong balls stacked up, and you sheared them, then they want the ping pong balls from the top row want to move into the spaces that provide, we provide for them. So the thing will actually, will actually get smaller. If you shear it and it's loose, it gets smaller. Conversely, if you have a dense soil, as you shear that soil, the ping pong balls want to move relative to each other, and so the, so the soil actually will expand. We call that dilation. So a soil can either compress or dilate during shearing. Now, he also found that for a given effective stress, that soil will actually move to a constant void ratio. So if it's a dense, a dense soil, it, it will dilate this void ratio. If it's a loose soil, it will compress down this void ratio, void ratio. This is called the critical void ratio. So when you shear soil, it wants to change volume. Now, if you have a situation where you are shearing soil, it's back to my bicycle pump again, I'm trying to make it change volume, but it can't. If it's trying to compress, then the pressure in those, in, in those, in those voids will go up. On the other hand, if, if I've got a very dense soil and I'm shearing it and, I don't, and, and, and water can't come into the, 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 the soil because it can't be we're permit, we're permitting it from expanding, then the pressure will actually go down. It's like getting my bicycle pump, filling it with water, and then pulling. If I pull, the pressure will go down inside my bicycle pump. So the soil, if you, if you don't allow the water to escape when you're shearing it, then if it's loose, it will, the pore pressure will go up. If it's dense, the pore pressure will go down. If the pore pressure goes up, the effective stress goes down. If the effective stress goes down, the strength goes down, the stiffness goes down, eventually you'll hit liquefaction. So, we have a soil which we're shearing, and if the pore pressure goes up to a certain amount, it will liquefy. And so, in a tip, in the, the earthquake on the 22nd of February, the main shock part lasted for about 10 seconds. So for about 10 seconds, it came to a peach for you know, a big part, about five seconds, but for 10 seconds, you were taking these little grains of, of, of soil and doing this to them. And as you were doing it, the water pressure was going, each cycle was going up and up and up and up and up until it got to a stage where the water pressure was, was, was the same as the overburden pressure, and so the soil, the effect of stress was zero, and so the soil liquefied, it became a liquid. And so the process of liquefaction is initiated in an earthquake by this, this movement of soil, trying to change volume, can't change volume, pore pressure goes up, pore pressure goes up, effect of stress comes down, effect of stress comes down, strength is lost and becomes a liquid. Now what happens then is that if you're standing on a liquid, you tend to sink. If you're a building standing on a liquid, you tend to sink. If, you, if, the li if, if your liquid is standing on a slope like that next to, next to a river, on a river bank, well, it just does this, because it flows. There's nothing to hold it, it's a liquid, it flows. And so whilst it's liquid, it just flows, and that's why we get these large cracks opening up, what we call lateral spreading. You've probably heard lateral spreading being used in the newspapers, because basically it's become a liquid, and it's gone, there's, been, it, there's, a, there's, a, there's a place where it can go, so it, so, so it moves. At the same time, you've got a bit of a crust. Um, the water pressure gets really, really, imagine water pressure underneath, underneath a bit of a membrane, and it bursts through, and up, up, up it comes, bringing sand particles and silt particles with it, and it creates what we call a sand volcano, or a sand boil, on the surface. You've probably seen these pictures of sand boils, or silt boils, on the surface. 
It can also, if it finds a manhole cover, and you know, it's this high pressure material, water is flowing through, and it can actually get into a manhole cover, and out it comes. Or even where a telegraph pole has fallen over, the telegraph pole's in the ground, it's lost its strength, there's nothing holding it. The wires pull it over, creates a nice hole where all this soil and silt can come up and spurt out into, into the surface. But it can keep on going even after the earthquake has actually stopped because you've got these high pressures underneath the ground, the water keeps on coming up, and as that water comes up, you also get pressures due to the flow of the water as well. So as the water pressure comes up, it increases the pore pressure, which keeps the effective stress at zero and causes even more flow. And so at the end of the earthquake, all the soil can be coming to the surface at certain places. And two things can happen. In certain situations, certain soils, because now after the earthquake, the pore pressure dissipates, now it can change volume. And so you get the settlement taking place that would have taken place had you allowed it to happen when you were shaking it. Also, you know, because you've got all this soil coming up the surface, and you've seen the photographs of, of, Plant, of, 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 of Christchurch, where people have been carting off you know, huge waste heaps of silt, and all that's come out the ground. And so what you find is that, you know, um, I, was, you know, I, was able, I would say it's fortunate to be in Christchurch shortly after the earthquake, but you know, it was able, from a scientific point of view, it was, it was fortunate. To see you know, that the, the, the ground had settled meter, maybe a metre and a half in places, and now, in the areas where they had the sort of lateral spreading by the rivers, they were now not only were the bay, they'd actually dropped a metre and a half, and so now there were more risk of flooding from rivers as well. So the thing sort of has moved down. So liquefaction can cause the ground levels to drop, be it because of the actual compaction or due to the removal of, ma of material. And so, you know, as a consequence of this lack of strength, we find that our structures will fail. Now, there are many, well, not many ways, but there are ways you can construct structures to survive um, this liquefaction, and there's ways of trying to prevent soil from liquefying. 